वेलकम ऑल दिस इज डॉक्टर मुबीन सैयद विद वन मोर एपिसोड ऑफ लॉन्ग स्टोरी शॉर्ट विद डॉक्टर बीन फ्रॉम द एफ एल सी 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 प्लेटफॉर्म सो लेट स्टार्ट अर डिस्कशन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल लेट्स लुक एट द रेफरेंसेज सो हियर इज द एफ एल सी 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 डॉट नेट साइट इट इज ऑल्सो कोविड नाइनटीन क्रिटिकल केयर डॉट कॉम एंड आई होप यू आर अवेयर दैट देर इज ए फर्स्ट एवर कॉन्फ्रेंस फ्राम द एफ एल सी 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 प्लेटफॉर्म दैट इज गोन बी हेल्ड इन ऑक्टोबर so hopefully you can join us so if you see here october 14 to 16 2022 orlando florida and then as you scroll down here there are so many resources here the most important thing for today's discussion is going to be these protocols because as we go over this study and we look at the symptoms and issues an important thing for clinician is going to be to understand what are the symptoms and the risk factors so there is a list i'm going to show you and i would hope that you can print out that list and leave it somewhere in your clinic when you are managing your patients you can look at that to see when to be aggressive i think we should always be aggressive with the covid management but there are certain red flags that should alert you as a clinician to pay even more attention and then when you say what are my choices how do i manage my patient then these protocols are a very important asset for a clinician so with this background here is a study symptoms and risk factors for long covid in non hospitalized adults this is some data from it this is the pdf so now let's start with the discussion so the question in our mind is that what symptoms and patient characteristics increase the likelihood of long covid from the authors point of view they said there are many studies that look at long covid and the phenotype of long covid and the symptoms of long covid however they said majority of those studies do not compare a long covid patient to a healthy person over period of time to try to understand that are these symptoms unique to covid infected patients or they are just background noise and they occur in healthy patients as well so this is the first study where there is a matched cohort of healthy individuals that were also used in this study analysis so it that makes the study robust and more reliable so here is a summary of the study So if you are a clinician this is a very important page for you. We know that anosmia has been a risk factor or an indicator for long covid. And here the study shows that anosmia patients who had anosmia had 6.49 times higher likelihood of developing long covid. And their definition of long covid was covid symptoms 3 months and after with or without resolution between the infection to the long covid so 6.49 times that is the adjusted hazard ratio for anosmia so the high the largest risk factor anosmia hair loss 3.99 times higher likelihood of developing long covid if somebody had hair loss during the infection sneezing 2.77 times However these two the next two are actually unique to this study these two were not seen in the other studies so once again as a clinician this is really interesting it will be interesting for you to figure that out as well with the patient but ejaculation difficulty so during the acute infection if somebody experienced sexual event and the ejaculation difficulty was experienced then such patients have 2.63 times higher likelihood of developing long covid similarly reduced libido 2.3x adjusted hazard ratio then shortness of breath at rest so there are two types of shortness of breath one is the shortness of breath when the person is exerting or doing some activities this is shortness of breath at rest 2.2 times fatigue 1.92 pleuritic chest pain 1.86 horse voice this is also new horse voice 1.78 and fever 1.75 i have to say that this is before omicron so i'll find some studies for omicron and compare them with this 
So this data is a little outdated from a variant point of view. And another interesting thing, which is just hot off the press, a few days ago, UK announced that the total population suffering with long COVID actually has reduced by 3%. So either the Omicron is not causing as much of long COVID and or the long COVID patients that had been suffering for months and years are recovering as well. So the overall population that is suffering from long COVID is reducing. This was not happening before. Previously, this population size of long COVID patients were continuing to increase. So this is the first time there is a reduction that is being observed, which is a good sign. Okay, so here are the important systems. What are the two important symptoms during the acute infection that are different or new? That is ejaculation difficulty and reduced libido. So if you're a clinician, I would request you to take a screenshot of this and keep it somewhere. This is an important one. Now, patient characteristics. Women were at increased risk compared to men. And how much increased? 1.5 times. So almost one and a half times more likelihood of developing long COVID compared to men. Then it is interesting that older age was less associated with long COVID compared to younger age of 18 to 30 years old. So it seems like younger age patients, when they develop COVID, their likelihood of developing long COVID is more than the older age. I can actually understand that in the older age, I'm getting in that zone as well. In the older age, our cells start functioning lesser. And so our reactions to things may reduce. Again, at the same time, we also know that with COVID, during the acute disease, older patients actually end up with more cytokine, but they are more fragile as well, and they have more comorbidities as well. On the other hand, a chronic immune dysfunction is difficult for their system to sustain because the cells are kind of becoming older or less functional or less in number, etc. Still, older age had lesser propensity. So if you see here, 30 to 39 years compared to 18 to 30. 30 to 39 had 6% lower risk and 70 years had 25% lower risk of long COVID compared to 18 to 30 years old. So that is very interesting. Smokers and ex-smokers also had a little more increased risk of long COVID. Then, of course, obesity. In this study, I think more than 40% of the patients were obese. So BMI of greater than 30 kilogram meter square having a 10% relative increase in risk of reporting long COVID symptoms compared to those with a BMI of 18, 25 kilogram meter square. So adjusted hazard ratio was 1.10. So obesity is a characteristic. Actually, the socioeconomic status as well, the less privileged someone is, so UK has these tiers in which they can measure how privileged someone is or not. The most privileged had the least likelihood of developing long COVID amongst the tiers. And then the least privileged or tier five had the highest likelihood of developing long COVID. In addition to that, there was increased risk seen in black Afro-Caribbean ethnic groups, 1.2 times more compared to whites. Mixed ethnicity, 1.14 compared to whites. Other minority groups, for example, American, Middle Eastern, Native Americans, Middle Easterns, Polynesian origin, 1.06. Not a lot of difference from the white ethnic group. Now, this is also important for clinicians. This is another screen that I would request you to take the screenshot and keep it with you or somehow figure out a way to keep it I'm sure that you, in your practice, you're already seeing patients with these propensities as well. So comorbidities, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD patients were 1.55 times more likely to have long COVID. And these are adjusted hazard ratios. Benign prostatic hyperplasia. I had not heard of this before. 1.39 times. Fibromyalgia. That is a pre-existing condition with a chronic inflammation, 1.37 times. 
anxiety 1.35 times, erectile dysfunction 1.33 times. So now we have difficulty ejaculation, loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, all of them contributing risk factor or all of them a risk factor towards long COVID. Depression 1.31 times, migraine 1.26 times, multiple sclerosis 1.26 times, celiac disease 1.25 times and learning disabilities 1.24 times. So this is another screen that we should take a screenshot of. Now symptom classes, this is another very interesting analysis that the researchers did. What they did was, I think they had about 115 symptoms and 62 categories of symptoms that they were looking at. And they did the word clouds for the most common symptoms observed by the long COVID patients. And there are three classes of the word clouds or three classes of symptom sets that they observed. The class one was the symptom set that were present in 80% of long COVID patients. In this class, if you see from top downwards, rash, abdominal pain, fatigue, hair loss, headache, anxiety, depression are the most common long COVID symptoms. If you look at the class 2, that is 5.8%. In this class, patients with cough, fatigue, shortness of breath, wheezing, phlegm, they had long COVID. And then on the class 3, this was 14.2% of the patients that were reporting this set from this set or that were categorized in this set because of what they reported, anxiety and depression, and then insomnia, cognitive problems, and so on. I think that this word cloud is very important as well. We should take a screenshot of this. I have the link to this diagram as well. Maybe you can print it out and keep it somewhere near you. 80% of the patients with long COVID are going to fall in the class one type of symptoms. So if you see those symptoms, for example, rash, abdominal pain, chest pain, fatigue, hair loss, headache, then it is important to become very vigilant to manage such patients. Now, study characteristics. I thought instead of putting that in the front, I'll discuss them later on. And I wanted to give you the summary of what the study is demonstrating. So the study characteristics is that it is analysis of the UK data. It's not a prospective study. It is really analysis of the pre-existing data in the UK database, 31st January 2020 to 15th April 2021 is the duration, so pretty much before Omicron, there were 486,149 non-hospitalized confirmed COVID positive patients and to match with them healthy individuals not known to have COVID and not known to be positive 1.94 million. And I think that there was a about half of them had at least one vaccine dose. This study was approved by CPRD, obtains annual research ethics approval from the UK's Health Research Authority. So that is the approval. And the researchers are from the Institute of Applied Health Research, University of Birmingham. Now, a couple of tables I want to share with you. So this is a deeper look. Table number two, and supplementary table 3a. So let's look at that. So in the main PDF, let's go to table two. This is a complete list of various risk factors and what is the adjusted hazard ratio of those factors. So for example here, if you see at the top sex, compared to men, so men are taken as a reference, women 1.52 times and as I mentioned before, so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but this is a very interesting table for you as a layperson or as a clinician to review it at least once. Similarly, if you see the age 18 to 29, if that was a reference, then as the age increases, the likelihood or adjusted hazard ratio reduces for long COVID. Here is the ethnicity data. Then this is the BMI data. Then here is the smokers data. So if you see here, Current smoker 1.12 times more and ex-smoker 1.08 times more. Then here is the socioeconomic status. And if you see here, the reference is the least deprived or most privileged. And then as the deprivation increases, you can see that the long COVID hazard ratio increases as well. Then these are the comorbidities that I went over. So this is one table and I would request you to look at this one. The second one is the supplementary table here 
in this PDF and that is this one. This is table 3A and this is the recording of symptoms after 12 weeks from index date comparison. So the way to look at this table is that for example let's say we go to breathing. So domain is the breathing, symptom is for example let's use shortness of breath at rest. Then cohort of patients infected with SARS-CoV-2, 384,000, comparator cohort, 1.5 million. So these are the two cohorts. And if you see here, for example, 51 patients had the shortness of breath at rest. And here, 105 healthy individuals during this time also had shortness of breath at rest. However, their adjusted hazard ratio of the infected patient developing long COVID was 2.2 times. So the one that I highlighted here, I've already discussed them in the previous few minutes, but it will be really important for a clinician to look at these and see what are the hazard ratios. The important thing, and I know that you already know that, to make sure that you look out for the identity crossing. For example, here, orthopnea is 1.07, but at the same time, it, the range is 0 0.54 to 2.15 when it crosses unity. So you just have to make sure that you look on the, for example, this proxismal nocturnal dyspnea is also not valid, statistically significant, and there are some that are. So for example, shortness of breath alone is 1.3 times, and that range is correct as well on one side of the unity. So that's the only thing to keep in mind. But here is the data as well, and they have done a great job of so many symptoms that they put together and their adjusted hazard ratios are here as well. So the takeaway, if I go back to the beginning of this, this is the important part here. Anosmia, hair loss, sneezing, ejaculation difficulty, reduced libido. We also saw on the other side, so shortness of breath at rest, fatigue, pleuritic chest pain, hoarseness of voice, and fever during the acute disease are indicators or red flags towards the long COVID. This is the discussion. Thank you very much for joining in and listening to the discussion. I would see you soon with one more episode. Stay safe, happy and healthy. Bye for now.